Hallelujah. How's everybody doing out there tonight? Good? Did you get a little refreshing from that worship? And Amen. That's good. You know, when uh, I used to do a... Can I get one of these, Jacob? Thank you. I used to do a small group on Friday nights back when Fran and I were first married. And there were many nights you'd just kind of drag in there on a Friday night. But then you'd get a little worship in you. And it was like that worship would just bring refreshing and uh, give you strength to continue to go forward. So, worshiping the Lord is a wonderful thing. Hallelujah. That we get that privilege of, of doing that. And tonight, we're just going to take a look into the Word here for a, a little bit. Talk a little bit about the, the glory of God. We want to continue in the vein that Pastor Mike started last Wednesday night when he was talking about his glory and about uh, Moses' desire to see the Lord's glory. Isn't that awesome that a man in the Old Testament had a desire to see the Lord's glory? That's boldness, guys. That's real boldness with the Lord because that's not something that was you know, written in the scrolls for a while and somebody had, uh, that looks good. That, that's, that's groundbreaking. That is pioneer forging a new path. And Moses, I love the boldness by which he exhibited there to say, Lord, this has never happened with anybody else on the face of the earth, but I want to see your glory. And I don't know when exactly he got the information or how he got the information about Adam and Eve, but maybe that stoked him if that was something that the Lord had revealed to him beforehand. And he thought, maybe God will do it again. Maybe God will walk in the midst of his people and I'll get to see him. Because that's what Adam and Eve have, right? They had a perfect environment and a, a perfect a father, perfect relationship, uh, but they were beguiled by the serpent. So I don't know what Moses had, but I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> and you know what? We, we could use some of that there. Let's, let's, let's push the envelope with God. Let's push the envelope with God. And I'm not talking in a way that is disrespectful, dishonoring, anything of that nature. But what I'm saying is that I believe that there are frontiers in God in this earth realm that we can begin to experience and walk in if we'll be like a Moses who has that same sort of spirit and say, maybe God will do it again. Maybe he'll do it again. You know, because you hear about some of the forerunners in the faith, the mothers and the fathers, and you hear about some of the great exploits and the encounters that they had with the Lord. God's doing something new today. He's not doing the same thing that he did, you know, back in the 1950s in the great healing revival. He's doing something completely different. And who wants to be a part of it? Who wants to be a part of that? Let the Lord, let the Lord know you want to be a part of it. Because that's really all about him showing forth his glory in a powerful way in your life. Well, hey, I want to look at we're going to go to 2 Corinthians here, and I hope it's okay, guys. I'm going to read some scripture tonight that are in a little bit of chunks if we got the time here. Let's see. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and my, my key verse tonight is going to be 18, but I'm going to start in verse 7. We'll just read down to 18. It says, Now at the ministry of death, this is the law because it's carved in letters on stone, the ministry of death, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, 
will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? I'm reading out of the English Standard Version in case you just wanted to know. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. So the law was good. The law was glorious. But what had come through the Spirit, what had come through Jesus Christ, was now so much more glorious than that that it made it look like it had no glory whatsoever. So it's not that it didn't have glory. It did have glory. But what we have now through Jesus Christ and through the Spirit of the living God is much more glorious. Let's see, where was I? Thank you. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Amen. There's that boldness that we're talking about. And it says, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, or from glory to glory is what some translations say. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what I read in that translation there is that we're to, to become more and more glorious, right? As we continue to walk on in the Lord with him, we're supposed to be more like him. Christ being formed in us, the hope of glory. And so we need to continue to become, we're like a fine wine, getting better and better with age. Isn't that right, Jennifer? Amen. Well, hey, the, the overarching principle that I want you to get tonight out of this whole thing is that whatever you behold or worship or adore, you will become like. Whatever you behold or worship or adore, you will become like. Remember when the Israelites in the wilderness, and of course Moses goes up on the mountain and he's up there for, what was it, 40 days, 40 nights, I believe it was, something of that nature. And, and they think that he's gone. He's not coming back. I, our leader has left us. And so now we're left to our own devices, and we don't know about this God that we can't see. Yeah, he did some things for us, but, man, I think he went on vacation, and he's not around anymore. So they get all the gold, you know, hey, take off your gold earrings, throw it in, and they, Aaron forges a golden calf and they rise up and begin to play and they begin to worship the golden calf and this is our God who's going to lead us and all this sort of man it's hard to believe it's really hard to believe isn't it that someone would think that a golden calf is going to be their their God it's unbelievable but it just goes to show you when sin is in man we can stoop to anything you know, it, it, if not for the grace of God, you know, there go I. I'd be in doing the same sort of thing, but the grace of God has touched our lives. But what happened is Moses comes down off the mountain, sees that they're worshiping. He actually takes it, grinds it up, puts it in their water, and makes them drink it. Now, I know we're supposed to have iron in our diet, but I don't know if we're supposed to have gold in our diet. <laughs> I don't know if that's any good or not. But they worshipped a golden calf. And what did they do for the next 40 years? They wandered around in the desert like a herd of cattle. And they never entered in 
most of them never entered into what they had for them, what God had for them. So what you become or what you will worship, you'll become. You know, you can see that easily as an example. Anyone who puts money first in their life, a, a, a man who begins to sacrifice family, tries to chase after the almighty dollar, that's the first thing that he thinks about. That's the last thing that he thinks about when he goes to bed. And he begins to make that the central focus of his life. That man's going to become a very greedy man. He will begin to lose his integrity. He'll begin to lose uh, how he conducts himself in the business realm because he doesn't care if he has to go ahead and cut a few corners and make some shady deals to make some more money. And unfortunately, that is probably the predominating culture that we have in our business here in America. But there are shining stars, amen, that know how to conduct themselves in a like manner. And I just believe that I, I love businessmen. I love the business realm because I think God wants to show his glory off in that place specifically in many different ways. So if you're in that area, be encouraged because God knows exactly what he's doing with you, Bobby. He knows what he's doing with you, Tracy. He knows what he's doing with you, Alan and Daryl, you guys that are out there, the ladies that are out there, and you're in that place. May the Lord's glory be upon you in this hour, in this hour, and give you favor and give you the connections because at times it feels like you've been the tail, that you haven't been the head. But I believe that the Lord would give you a word of encouragement that the season is coming, that he is making you the head and not the tail in practicality, that he is raising you up to display his glory through you. And it's not it's not the pie in the sky thing. You know that already. You fought the battles. You've gone through stuff. You're going through stuff now. But I just want to encourage you tonight that whatever battles that you're facing, if you'll continue to honor the Lord, put him first, seek his face, that he will show up for you. We just declare a breakthrough word to you now tonight in Jesus' name. Do you receive that? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Whatever you worship, you'll become like. Why do you think we spend 30 to 40 minutes on a Sunday morning worshiping? That's the thing to do. We don't have to do that. We could just say, forget that, and let's just go ahead and read some word and listen to Pastor Mike be done with it. We take that time, does a couple things. First of all, we want to enthrone him in our praises. He's already enthroned, but it's good for us to acknowledge it. It's good for us to be in that place and give him worship because we behold him. And when we behold him, we become like him and something shifts in our heart. Our hearts begin to soften. Sometimes I've heard it said before that worship is the plow that gets our hearts ready to receive the seed of the living God when the word is being preached. I just want to encourage you. Can I encourage you and exhort you? If you guys have an appointment with God, like if he was on your appointment calendar, would you show up on time? If you had an appointment with him at 9 o'clock, tomorrow morning, would you get there at 9 o'clock or maybe even a little bit before? I would. Can I exhort you on Sunday morning that you've got, this is, this is Wednesday night crowd. These are the leaders right here, the people that are sitting in this room. I exhort you, show up on time on Sunday mornings. Be ready to worship. Be ready to give something to the Lord. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your heart. Show up to give your heart to the Lord on time on Sunday mornings. 
Because we, we need you folks to lead. You set the tone. The people sitting right here. And I tell you what, because that is contagious. That type of attitude, that type of passion, that type of enthusiasm is contagious because we need to build and continue to build a culture and an atmosphere of hunger, of passion, and of expectation that our God can do anything that he desires to do. So I would just ask you, come on. Let's, and when we worship, let's worship. Let's worship with the hearts. Let's, and I know that there it talks about a sacrifice of praise. I totally understand that. That sometimes you come in, most of the time maybe, you don't feel like it. Well, if, if we all went by our feelings, we probably most of the time wouldn't get out of the bed. Okay, we got to get up and rock and roll. And we, and we got to give our hearts and our lives to the Lord and we're going to say, I'm getting up and I'm going to worship the living God. Amen? So hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So I, I, I like the word beholding here. In the Greek, it means to present a clear and correct image of a thing. To present a clear and correct image of the thing. And really, that's why I, I, I think the thing that's so important is that Christ, one of his main missions when he came to the earth was to unveil or to reveal the Father, to reveal him. Who was he and what is he like? Because over the years, there's been so much distortion because of the law. Because what happened, God always wanted to have relationship with man back in the garden. It started there, right? Adam and Eve chose another route. And that's where we get freedom ministries that, you know what, it's not by rules. It's not by regulations. But that's what we can easily get hung up on is it's rules and regulations. But the Lord's always wanted relationship with us. Even going to Mount Sinai, it's incredible when uh, Moses was going through that. And he was saying to the people, draw, draw near to the mountain. And the mountain was black and lightning and all that sort of stuff. The people didn't want to hear from the Lord directly. It scared them. That's why we were singing tonight, you know, I want, I want to behold your glory and I'm not afraid. That means that we're going to go ahead, we're going to press in. We're going to go past what our emotions are saying in that situation. So, so God wanted to have a relationship even then with all the people that he was bringing out. But the people said, no, 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 we don't want to hear for, uh, from God for ourselves. But, but Moses, you, you go meet with him. You go meet with him and you find out what's going on and then you come and you tell us. So God gets rejected again. God was always getting pushed out. Every time, he, even when later on when he wanted to lead the children uh, in their government, what they do? They clamored for a king, wanted a king. They had to be like the other nations around us. Give us a king, give us a, give us a king. And so they rejected the Lord's leadership in that process. But Jesus came, and then through all the years of the, the law bringing the curse, curses that they walked through, and judgments on people and on nations, all that sort of stuff. God didn't want to, that wasn't an option A for him, let's say. That wasn't option A. But he had to place some of that, the law, in place so that he, had, he could have some type of relationship uh, ability with them. The problem is, is they didn't see the heart behind the person who gave the laws. And so they said, you know what? We can do that as foolish as they were, we can do that. I can fulfill the law. I can do those Ten Commandments right there. But you know what? They were trying to establish their righteousness on their own, and they weren't receiving the righteousness that Abraham received when he received it by faith. And so that was the problem. And so God has this, this, by mankind, has this distorted view now. We don't understand him. 
I'm not talking about us. We're ta I'm talking about the people of Israel back in the day in the Old Testament. They didn't understand him. They didn't know who he was. But, uh, but Jesus came to reveal the Father. It says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In the face of Jesus Christ. That we are to behold Jesus with an unveiled face ourselves so that we may see the glory of God in that. In John 1, 14 through 18, it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He, Jesus, has made him, the Father, known. Has made him known, known in the Greek means to make known, or listen to this, to rehearse in the Greek, to rehearse. I really like that a lot. So what's that mean? Jesus is made to rehearse the Father. Well, let's just take a look at his life when he was healing the blind man. What was he doing? Yeah, the, the blind man was receiving ministry and he was being made whole. What was he doing, though, also? He was rehearsing the heart of the Father. What about the woman with the issue of blood when she came up and pressed through and she received her healing? He was rehearsing the heart of the Father. Everything that he was doing, everything that he was saying, that he was declaring because they were one. He only, saw, he only did what he saw the Father doing. He only said what he saw or he heard the Father saying. And so he's out there and he's basically saying, this is the Father. I'm the exact representation of the Father. And so and that's the challenge for us is when we see something good going on from the Lord, whether it's someone else's testimony or it's your testimony, Man, stop for a second. Praise the Lord with them. Rejoice with them. We need to know how to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It's really important to be able to do that because sometimes someone's rejoicing. They're rejoicing over something that you really have need of. Can you rejoice with them? Can you rejoice in their healing when you need to be healed? Can you rejoice in their financial breakthrough when you need financial breakthrough? It's easier said than done, but if you make a choice to do it and you honor the work of God, because what it does is it sets you up for your financial breakthrough. It sets you up for your healing. You honor the work of God. Don't despise that in somebody else's life. You honor that. Because life flows through honor. Okay? Where am I? I lost my train of thought. John 1 18. To rehearse. He's rehearsing the Father. The other meaning on that is to unfold in teaching. To unfold in teaching that he just unfolds a revelation. He unfolds it to you so you begin to see the exact picture of who the Father really is. In Hebrews, it says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
The, the Father had such a relentless pursuit of us, even when he was being cast aside. See, the Father's, he's, been, he's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He just had to deal with people differently at that time. And so you, you can see a lot of people have a problem with the Father, the God in the Old Testament, because he's saying, you know, kill your enemy. Wipe them out. When you go in, you have war. Or don't take any of their people to, be, to, to marry, that sort of thing. But what he was dealing with is he was trying to set apart a people that was explicitly for himself. The problem is, is they, they never gave their heart to him. And so they just tried to do their own behavior modification on their own and say, oh, I, oh, we can do this. And it didn't work. So in Exodus 34, 4 through 7 here, I, I wanted to read this scripture again. I know that Pastor Mike read out of it last week, but I, I think it bears repeating because it's such a powerful scripture. Because the, the best way that we can judge somebody about who they really are is by what they say and by what they do, by what they say, and by what they do. You really can't take a good guess at a person's motive of their heart. All you can all, only do is that you might, because of what they say and what they do, you might have a good indication of what their motive is. So this is the Lord speaking about himself here. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord, as the Lord passed before him, the Lord proclaimed this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, faithfulness, excuse me, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That sounds like our Father, right? But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And then later on in Ezekiel, he, he actually changes that and says that the sin of the father would not pass down to the son and the person who will die would be the person who sins. Okay, so it wasn't passed down later on in Ezekiel. I think it's like 16 or 17, something like that. So God, it just goes to show you that God wasn't a pushover. There, there is such thing as sin, and he knew that there was sin, but he, and he had a standard of holiness because his, the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. The f righteousness and justice. So who he is, he's a just God. There has to be justice in the system. And so when Jesus came and took the penalty of our sin and all the wrath was poured out upon him, then justice was made complete. And that's why we get to stand in the mercy and the grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ now. In Hebrews 8, 6 through 13, it says this, talking about this new covenant because the writer of Hebrews grabs out of Jeremiah this, this uh, passage of Scripture talking about a new covenant that was coming. And it says this, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, and this is the passage of scripture from uh, Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. Amen. 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Christ made the new covenant for us. He became the express image of God. He came to reveal the Father in all of his glory. We're talking about God's glory tonight. One of the greatest things that we can do if we want to behold the glory of the Lord is take a look at Jesus. Take a look at Jesus, what he did, what he said, and you know what? What he's doing right now in your heart, in your mind. What's he saying? What's the spirit of the Lord saying to you? Hallelujah. Now, I just wanted to give you some a little practical stuff here too, that God's glory can be seen. Okay? Real easy. God's glory can be seen. As a matter of fact, the very first time that the glory of the Lord is mentioned, I believe it's in Exodus, and it talks about the provision of the Lord. When he said that he was going to put manna down on the ground, and he said to them, he goes, I'm a, you're going to see the glory of the Lord in the morning. They're out in this desert. They don't have anything to eat. But you're going to see the glory of the Lord in the morning. And he, and he was referring to the manna that he was laying down on the ground for them supernaturally. Isn't that neat that the first thing that God does in the mention of the glory of the Lord has to do with provision, has to do with the blessing for them temporarily. God's glory can be very practical or it can be very mystical. Practical means, you know, the day-to-day, -day, that sort of thing, because I think we can see the glory of the Lord in a lot of different ways. You know, we can see the glory of the Lord in creation, because God can speak to you easily through a flower, a bird, a sunrise, a sunset, looking out on the lake, you know, that sort of thing. It could be in a great conversation that you have with a friend that just unlocks some things in your own heart. Uh, it, it can be a hug. Uh, it can be a smile. So very practical, the glory of the Lord. God, didn't we just pray tonight, Lord, show us your glory? We were singing it, Lord, show us your glory. Well, I think sometimes what happens is we step over his glory and we don't even know we're doing it. You know, God's going, saying, I'll show you my glory. And then we kind of brush it to the side because we don't think it, it should be coming a different way because this is the glory of the Lord. So it can be very practical. But at the same time, <laughs> it can be very practical powerful and it can be mystical okay um you can go back and take a look at the prophets in the old testament some of the encounters that they had with him uh some of the encounters that they had with angels uh that sort of thing that are just powerful and it's like my goodness make you shake in your boots which literally daniel did when he encountered uh, an angel of the lord but just being in his presence, sensing his presence, that's part of his glory. Sensing his love for you is part of his glory. Or it can also even be that God speaks to you in an odd way, but it's very pra applies very practically to your life. And I'll go back to Peter. When the Lord uh, was trying to break Peter's tradition, thinking that, the gospel was only for the Jewish people, but it was for all men. And I think it's in Acts chapter 10 when he lets down the sheet to Peter and there's all kinds of animals in it. And this is in this trance vision state that Peter is, is uh, experiencing. You know, God didn't have to show him a vision with all that stuff in it and rise, Peter, go and eat. And Peter's like, no, you know, I'm a good Jewish boy. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm never going to make myself unclean. 
and, and the Lord shows it to him again, you know, trying to break through the tr tradition, you know. And then finally, the, the guys from Cornelius' house knocks on the door, and they say, hey, these guys are wanting you to go with them. God didn't have to show him that that way. God said it could have said, hey, Pete, um, your theology's a little off. Uh, you know, the, this gospel that you're preaching, it's for the Gentiles too. But why does, he do, why does he decide to do that sort of stuff? I don't know. Do you know? Sometimes I think it's to bypass our defenses, to bypass some of our walls and things of that nature so God begins to show us things in a different way so that we can receive him. So God can be show you something very practical that applies to your life, but do it in kind of a, a mystical way. And, and he loves metaphors. He, he, he loves metaphors. He loves visions. He, I mean, it's all, it's all in the Bible. He loves to give you dreams. God speaks in dreams, guys. And those are allegories. They're pictures, you know. They're little parables that are playing out in your head, but God has something very practical in store for you. So, when we ask, show us your glory, Lord, let us be expectant and aware. Maybe we can even make that just a, a prayer experiment this week. It's just, Lord, show us your glory, and then say, Lord, help me. Help me to recognize your glory this week, Lord. And, and, and shoot them up to the office by email or something like that. And just let's, let's just see what, what glory the Lord's revealing to each and every one of us. I think that would be a great prayer experience. Anybody, anybody up for doing that this week? Just so that we can walk something out practically in our lives. The question, though, that I've got for you that I want to end on tonight is... What are you beholding? What are you beholding? Because we can behold a lot of different things. The financial breakthrough that we really need, we can be beholding our lack of finances. That healing that you need, we can be beholding the sickness. We can be beholding the sin pattern in our lives. We can be beholding our weakness, our frailty. See, because it's real easy to get distracted off of him and his promises. The promises are full of his glory also. And, I, and I'm not preaching to you guys. I'm preaching to myself also. What am I beholding? I'm right there with you. But it's so easy because the enemy wants to get us off and not looking at him, but focusing on our problem, our situation, that sort of thing. When the problem's really not the problem, the problem is how we perceive the problem. Can we pray tonight, guys? Father, I just want to thank you tonight for your glory that's with us, your presence that's been here, that you've uh, strengthened and ministered hearts, God. And Father, we just come before you right now and just help us to, uh, help us to focus on you, to behold you, Lord, not our lack of finances, not our uh, situations, uh, not that relationship that we don't know what to do about. Father, none of those things, Lord God. Because, Father, when we look at those things, we become defeated. But, Father, when we look at you, God, there's such hope and strength and just encouragement to our hearts, oh God. So I just pray over this people here tonight, Father, that, Lord, that they would be those, Father, who purposefully choose to behold you, 
to push through the emotion and the distraction to see your face, Lord. Give us a tenacity, Lord, and a boldness, Lord, to say, show us your glory and help us, Father, not to pass over that in our day-to-day lives. God, we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, how about we just uh, hook up with two or three people and bless one another real quick before we leave tonight. Speak a blessing over them. Speak the glory of the Lord over them and let them be encouraged by your words. You guys are released.